Good afternoon. Hey everyone, thank you for showing up. I was preparing all afternoon to say uh, that I'm acutely aware that I'm the only thing in between you guys and the bar, uh, but I just checked and saw that the bar is already open, so I'm really flattered and honored that you guys made it. So I'll uh, try and keep things moving since it is late in the afternoon. Since we're talking about the convergence of user experience design and storytelling today. Well, first let me just introduce myself. My name is Adam Kleinberg. I'm the CEO of Traction. We're an interactive agency in San Francisco, and it's our uh, belief that um, everything is interactive, and it's kind of how we approach the world, and I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that. Um, but I thought it was appropriate that we started with a story. So I thought I would tell you mine and you know, how I've come to be talking about kind of this intersection of user experience design and, and, uh, and storytelling. I moved to San Francisco back in like 1996, right at the dawn of the internet. Um, I think like a month after I moved out, uh, I got my first email address and I went out and I bought a Mac. Um, and I kind of had a friend, I was kind of graduated from Cornell a few years earlier and was struggling to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up. I'd always been an artist. And uh, I had a friend who dropped off a, uh, who was a designer, a graphic designer, and um, they dropped off a, a um, bootleg copy for me of Photoshop. So I put that on my machine and I went out and I spent $45 on a book called uh, Adobe Classroom in a Book and I taught myself how to use Photoshop. And all of a sudden I was a web designer. Um, hung up a shingle, I went on Craigslist, I got a few jobs, and I started to make a little bit of a living uh, designing websites and really thinking holistically about, you know, how do I pull this whole thing together? Really from, you know, no one really knew what a website site should be at that point. A few, uh, about a year later, I got a job at uh, an agency called Think New Ideas, and I've got a picture of a baby because we were all babies. We were an agency of like 60 people. I don't think there was anyone there under 30. And once again, we were still figuring out kind of what does this whole interactive experience mean? Um, we didn't have visual designers and user experience designers there at that time. We had one team that kind of, you know, pulled the whole thing together. So we would start, and the creative team would start with, um, pulling together the user experience uh, from a blank slate. And what was really interesting, I think New Ideas, it was this agency that was kind of an integrated agency ahead of its time. Right? We were doing you know, large-scale e-commerce development, and these are some sites that we worked on and I worked on early in the days for brands like SGI and Avery, uh, doing large-scale e-commerce, but the same team was also doing advertising and print advertising. I think it was uh, probably, you know, the dot-com boom and, and, you know, the greed of the founders. It was take whatever money we could get. But we had one team thinking holistically around this. We were also uh, pulling together uh, the world's first banner ads. This is for Tony Stone Images, which is now Getty. You can see all that copy on the side of the ad. And we were animated GIF ninjas. And, you know, we were also doing something interesting, which was thinking about how does offline and online world work together. Um, in 2000, I took three months off. I went to Thailand. I biked across northern Thailand. And when I came back, I got recruited to start a uh, San Francisco office of Tribal DDB, which is part of DDB Needham, advertising agency. Um, and me and my partner, uh, one of my two founding partners, Theo Fanning, who's uh, my cr creative director at my agency, uh, we're both kind of recruited to start this office. And DDB was an interesting agency. All of a sudden, I was, I'd never considered myself in advertising before. And all of a sudden, I was working at this ad agency. And what I learned was how to tell stories, right? This is a very famous ad um, pulled together by Bill Bernbach, who is the B in, in uh, DDB, right? And, uh, you know, the copy on the ad says uh, something along the lines of, you know, this, this car didn't make the cut. There was a blemish on the glove compartment. You probably would have missed it, but Inspector Kurt Kroner did, uh, didn't. You know, and goes on and tells a story of how this, this ad, this car was a lemon, 
because of this slight blemish. And it was the first time, really, that stories had been told in advertising. Before that, you know, before the, the, the Mad Men days, right, it was just they would show a product, they would show, you know, a price tag. It was all very heavy-handed advertising. And this was kind of like getting into psychology and starting to tell stories and thinking about how they resonated. You know, but one of the things we found that we were really frustrated with um, at DDB and was, was kind of the silos between the traditional and the digital worlds. So me and my partners in 2001 decided to break off and start our own agency with kind of the, the, the mantra that everything was interactive. We were going to have one team that thought holistically around all our clients' business. You know, when uh, the dot bomb exploded, we all lost our jobs at uh, DDB. They, they, everyone in San Francisco seemed to lose their jobs at that point. Uh, they closed the San Francisco office. So kind of like a phoenix from the ashes, we started uh, Traction. And Traction was essentially at that point a glorified, you know, we were a, team of, a glorified team of freelancers who happened to have a website. Right, so we worked at a lot of other agencies. Um, we continued to do both website development and marketing work, when we, whatever we could kind of get to pay the bills. Uh, anyone out here freelance? So you've kind of lived that road, right? So we, we took whatever we, can got, we could get, and we wound up kind of, I, I talk about, um, you know, we were like Reese's peanut butter. You got your chocolate in my peanut butter. Right? We, we started doing both uh, web development and advertising out of the agency. And this was back in 2001 where kind of that kind of thinking um, was unique. It was different. You know, I'd like to say it was some grand strategic plan, but it was really just that we wanted to, um, you know, we liked doing print. We liked doing websites. So we kept doing both. And, of course, we continued to do it and have one, creative team that was doing both the user experience design and thinking about the concept work and how we told stories for, for the clients that we created. Now the result was that we created an agency that kind of sits at this intersection of psychology and technology, right? We design the entire brand experience and because we understand psychology, we kind of look at how ideas and why ideas resonate with consumers and we also understand technology and user experience and are able to make sure that those ideas are feasible and, and, and work. Um, and we've been able to work with some pretty great brands along the way. So, you know, why this notion of user experience and storytelling? How did they come to pass? How, why is this marriage kind of taking place today in, in marketing? Um, well, kind of a little bit of a history lesson, right? Let's look at a couple of trends that have happened over the last two years, the last 10 years, I'm sorry. One is this notion of digital empowerment. Uh, I was at the data presentation earlier and someone talked about um, the, the, the famous quote that half my advertising is a waste of money, I just don't know which half. Right now we're able to, for the first time to measure the results of our marketing efforts and our investments in, in, in developing experiences um, for the first time. The other trend has been this kind of relentless economic super pressure that's come from the, the, um, the, you know, the, the turbulent economy we live in. You know, and the result has been this relentless focus on ROI and, and, and brand organizations. You know, but the pendulum has kind of switched because of that focus too far, right? If we go back and we look at kind of user experience design and like what's our tool set as user experience designers, right? It's things like personas, use cases, site maps, ultimately wireframes. We're creating frameworks, right? But what about emotion? Oh man, there we go. Now, now my timing's right. What about emotion? Um, you know, that's kind of missing from the, the, the user experience design framework. You know, the, what's happening now, however, is that brands are becoming commoditized. There's so many brands on shelves, there's so much clutter out there, right, that the differentiation between one brand and the next, just by what's traditionally gone on in advertising, isn't enough. 
right? Advertising, however, has got a lot that we can learn from, right? Advertising, what Don Draper knew, right, is that advertising is about perception, persuasion, motivation, desire. How do we create those things? You know, this is what digital has become, right? Trying to get people to, to click, 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 you know, convert, convert, convert. And this has been the focus of, of a really large part of the marketing, the digital marketing landscape, right? This is a great quote. 50% of what we should be doing for brands is not predictably quantifiable. This is from Scott Bedbury, who's the former CMO of Nike and Starbucks, right? So a guy knows a thing or two about, about brands and marketing, right? And I know it's an accurate quote because he told it to me at the bar <laughs> um, at a conference that he was speaking at. Um, you know, this is your customer. This is your user, right? And just branding isn't enough today. If you don't bring value to your customer through the experience you provide, you know, you're, you're, dead, you're dead man walking, right? So this is why we're seeing, you know, the discipline of user experience design is going up while advertising is, is, a, is a struggling beast. This is a human brain. Right? Human brain makes decisions. Right? You've got the uh, left side, right side, sorry. And that's the rational part. And you've got the left side, that's the emotional part, right? It's the emotional part that makes decisions, right? And that's really important for us to remember. And that's why storytelling is so important, because stories convey emotion. Stories are what people respond to. You know, we're, we're hitting this at, at the same time, we're in this kind of changing world, right? Where there's a new level set for consumers. They have a different expectation from a digital experience, right? The app landscape has completely shifted our expectations for a digital experience, right? 30% of American adults are now have a tablet over 60% are on smartphones, right? They're all tapping and zooming and swiping, right? At the same time, we've got new capacity, 90%. 90% of, of, of um, US households, over 90% now have broadband, right? That means we can use images in different ways than we have in the past, right? As part of our user experience landscape, right? And you think about the power that a single image can convey. This is a friend photo taken by uh, Brian Marcy, who's the editor of uh, Digiday during uh, Sandy. It became a meme on the internet. But you just look at this photo and think about the whole story that this one snapshot conveys. You know, there's new browsers, right? This is, has anyone looked at Square's homepage? Right, Square has this beautiful kind of startup effect, right, where images kind of subtly build as, as the, the web page comes together, right? And this is kind of looking at Google developer tools, show you how they actually build that, right? Transparent PNGs are now something that aren't just kind of, you know, a, a, a future technology. They're here. There's new tools, HTML5, right? Advanced JavaScript, responsive de design. This is my wife, your user. She's not a freaking idiot, right? Like how many times as a, like has, how many times I was told, right, that I can't put a scroll bar, this is in the early days, but I couldn't put a scroll bar into a user experience because the user might not know what to do with it. Or we couldn't put something below the fold because people are too stupid to figure out that there might be interesting content below, right? That's not the case, and we're realizing that now. You know, brands have also kind of made this notion of engagement as a core imperative. You know, brands now have two, two basic objectives that they're looking for when they're creating experiences. One is to engage, and the other is to convert, right? But engagement is kind of part of them, and conversion is a science, but engagement, engagement is an art. You know, this is another thing I'm kind of, you know, 
how many, I can't tell you how many user experience designers, myself included, right, have said like a great user experience is one that's invisible. Bullshit, right? It's not enough to be invisible today because that's not gonna create emotion, right? Today, like you cannot separate your content from the experience that you're creating, right? They're one and the same, right? I mean, sure, there's examples that, you know, you could be a publisher and you're gonna say like, this is where this article is gonna go, right? But more and more, we need to think about not just what is the, 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 the information architecture and the interaction design, but you know, how are we going to, to convey emotion? How are we gonna use interaction to, to provoke? Right? How are we gonna use it to convince? How are we gonna tell a story? It's like building, well, I didn't make my point here. <laughs> right? But it's like building a house without knowing how many people are gonna live, it, live in it. To think about you know, what is the, 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 the experience we're gonna design without thinking about what content is gonna be within it. Right? You need to think holistically today. You know, so where are companies, how are companies dealing with kind of this changing landscape? Well, some are doing a great job and some are um, doing an oafish one, right? This is what Sears is doing, right? Sears has uh, got a website called Shop Your Way. That's kind of the next generation of whatever they're doing over at Sears, right? So they, they've got Pinterest copycat. They got, okay, it's a social shopping experience. They've got three different ways for me to help me choose a vacuum. I don't know. Kim Kardashian. Apps. I can add apps to my shopping experience. Questions. If you could have lunch with any person, dead or alive, who would it be? Nine people have answered. Great. Um, <laughs> this is not an experience. I mean, this is not thinking holistically about the user experience. This is feature vomit. Right? You know, and how's that working for you, Sears? Right, but this is not like just a problem that Sears has, right? Chevy, I have, I have a great clout score, right? So I'm an influential person, so I got a clout perk, right? Chevy lent me a Chevy Volt for the weekend, right, because of my clout score, right? Beautiful car until you get inside, right? There's so many buttons, there's a touch screen interface. I wound up running a red light trying to figure out how to use the air conditioner. More feature vomit. How's that working for you, Chevy? You know, um, and, and you know, this is important. You know, people aren't buying the Chevy Volt. It's not because people don't want electric cars. Maybe that's part of it. But a big part of it is because people aren't having an amazing experience when they're driving it. So they're not raving about it and telling all their friends about it, right? And those friends aren't going out and buying it because their friends aren't telling them how great it is. You know, but other brands are telling stories through user experience. You know, look at what Apple's doing. It's designed for experience, right? This is a website for the, uh, the new iPhones. You know, this is interaction that's just for exploration, and you can't create this kind of interaction without thinking about what the content is. You know, there's interaction for the sake of emotion. This is uh, Jawbone for their um, jam box. Right? These buttons, all they do is change the background. It's just about exploring emotion. The content doesn't change at all. There's platforms for storytelling. Uh, how many people have used Yahoo Weather? I love Yahoo Weather. I'm going to show you a video. But, like, you know, they, they, they're, they're integrating Flickr images, right? So every time I, I, I pull up for whatever city I happen to be in, Yahoo Weather, it, it shows me a different story, right? That background image that, that they pull from Flickr, they, they actually have 30 people curating images from all over the world to kind of bring this experience and storytelling to life. Don't just check the weather, see it.
your daily weather report. Now with location-based Flickr integration, the most accurate local and global climate predictions, and sunrise and sunset times. Download the all-new Yahoo Weather app. The forecast... So Yahoo can give me their feed. But that's beautiful work, right? And, um, y you know, it's, it's like every time I experience it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing something new, right? And I'm about th able to think through what is that story. And for, like, those of you who are like, well, I still have to prove the numbers. Can, can it work for conversion? Can storytelling work for conversion? You know, this is a, a site that my, my agency did, or a landing page for... A zone alarm, an online security software uh, that was created a new software p that you could download from the cloud. And um, we created the metaphor of someone, a stunt double, taking the hits no matter where they went. They could go to the park, coffee shop, and uh, pick a place, pick a threat. Sets up his uh, stunt double. <laughs> right, so he comes back up. He actually holds up a sign that says, download the beta, right? You know, but this was a completely a direct response program. We had a 69% conversion rate. That's of completed downloads, right? So storytelling does work. So, so, you know, the art of storytelling. I'm hoping, hope, wanted to, you know, give you a few things to think about. Obviously, you know, there's, there's a lot to it, and I'm not going to teach you, you know, the, the entire craft of, of how to tell a story. But I think there's basic things that you can, you can take away that uh, hopefully will, will, will help you in, in thinking differently about how you're bringing this together. And, of course, because someone's got to pay for all this, I'm going to, really talk about the art of brand storytelling. All right, so there's three elements of brand story. One is the message, one is tone, and one is structure. So the first is the message. You know, when we, when we, we, we approach branding, right? Um, at my agency, we have a philosophy that in the mind of the customer, you can only be one thing, right? If I say to you, I'm doing three, I do three things, I'm not really saying I'm really great at any one thing. So we really look for how do we, um, you know, f look at the consumer, look at, at, at uh, the, the landscape, the competitive landscape, how do we look at the truths about the brand or the product and come up with what's that one thing that's going to resonate and ring true in every interaction, right? And that's kind of what we learned from advertising. But the same thing kind of goes through when you're uh, trying to connect with people through an experience, right? Like how do you come up with that one thing that's gonna drive what you do? So with Adobe, uh, we were tasked to uh, come up with a program to reach college students, right? And uh, to engage them so we could convert them, right? But if Adobe were going to launch this program, they would be talking about, you know, their new cloud, crowd, uh, cloud pricing and why that's so great, right? They'd be talking about features. They'd be talking about whatever it is they want to sell, right? But this is how people actually use Photoshop, right? You know, like a lot of you have probably seen this image before. It was a meme a few years ago. Um, but not many of you probably realized or, or were sure where that image came from, right? But this is how people use Photoshop. So we took that core insight and we created an experience that was a storytelling platform, right? Based on that core insight that what people do with Photoshop is manipulate images. So we created a, this game and we did a, a, an application in Facebook and one on their website that challenged people to guess whether their series of images were real or fake. Cow on the beach, what do you guys think? Awesome. 
fake, right? And then if you were, if it was fake, you got to experience a tutorial and actually learn how to create this effect through Photoshop, right? Um, 40% of people, right, who played this game came back and re-engaged and played again, right? Another 40% experienced a tutorial. 6% clicked on an offer. 6% sh shared. So all these, you know, brand objectives, you know, we talk about aligning brand objectives with human behavior, right, in terms of how we approach this. All of these were accomplished and, and woven into this experience, but that whimsy and that story was as well. And as it grew and was successful, Adobe also added the ability for people to submit their photos and, and become a part of the storytelling experience, which is really powerful. There's tone, right? Basically, you know, on the, on the continuum of tone that you got drama on one side, you got comedy on the other. In the middle, you've got the no tone zone. It's kind of a bad place to be, right? Different, different tones for different people, different companies. All right over here, we got the SPCA zone. Other side of the spectrum, we've got the anything with monkeys zone. All right. This is an example. Um, this is a pretty extreme example. I mean, this is an atrocious uh, a user interface design, as you, you'll, you'll see. Uh, but when Migo Software came to us, this was the interface that they had been using. And um, Migo had a product that was a, a mobile syncing software, right? So you could plug it in. On a, lived on a USB drive. Uh, they had an OEM deal with Kingston, who made was the leader in, in, in thumb drives. So you plugged it into one computer, plugged it into another, and it synced all your files, right? And I'm sure you guys are very tech savvy, all of you. I say the word synchronize or sync, and you're like, ah, oh, makes total sense. But if I said that to my mother, right, she would, she would look at me like I was crazy. What are you talking about? Something in the kitchen, right? So when we redesigned the interface for this, you know, we really kind of changed the tone, right, and thought about how can we make this more of a, 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 an, an interface that people can see themselves in and can imagine that their own story. Simple things like changing sync to grab, right? And using a thermometer to kind of show how full you are, right? You know, and, and how full your, your drive is and have that visual storytelling device, right? Help make this more interaction-focused uh, experience um, more connect better with, you, with users. And, and Migo went from uh, Kingston about to drop them from their OEM deal to... Uh, and making a major investment in the company the next year. You know, and finally, there's structure. You know, when you think about kind of the components of, of what you need to have in the structure, you need a hook, right? If, if there's not something that's going to pull people in, you're not going to stick around. There's kind of, I, I talk about this user behavior, I call the audition. Right? It's like people audition digital content. Like they, they make a snap decision in half a second, and you need to somehow pull them in. How are you going to do that? Right? Once you've done that, um, you need some sort of a plot, just like any story. And again, since someone does have to pay the bills, what's the next action you want them to take? How are you going to wrap this up and have it lead somewhere? Right? So this is an integrated experience and campaign we did for Alibaba.com. Alibaba is the largest uh, e-commerce platform in the world. They're a Chinese-based company. They, they connect buyers and sellers around the world. So you can find the perfect partner to do business with, whether you're um, finding it, making it, or selling it. Right? Um, and when they approached us to, to launch the brand in the United States, this kind of concept of global sourcing was a very new concept for most small businesses in the United States, right? People just didn't have that kind of mindset in there that they could go on this website and connect with somebody in China and do business in a safe and easy way. So not only did we have to create a campaign, right? We also had to create an experience that would help people be successful 
with Alibaba.com, right? So we created a website, a uh, US-based website called success.alibaba.com um, that kind of had all kinds of resources thought through, but really kind of structured to um, have a hook, a plot, and an action at the end. You know, if I go back, kind of the approach that we took was to tell stories, right? We created stories about, um, you know, their, their one thing was you could find a perfect partner and kind of the three sub messages that they had from that were that you could find it, make it, or sell it. So we had stories about entrepreneurs, right, that we created in, in advertising and then we used those stories to kind of weave through the digital experience. You know, so as we kind of started wireframing, you know, we designed a hook. We, we actually, um, thinking holistically about this, we, we actually created a, um, like a carousel, right, that we actually used these characters. And this example also happens to have green screen. I'm not recommending green screen for every problem, right? But uh, we used a green screen navigation element to kind of hook people in and get them engaged. You know, then we had, in this case, again, videos that kind of told the story. It's a simple, you know, it's a simple way, but, you know, video is now ubiquitous. So it should be part of how you think about communicating the story. Right? What's the content of that video, right? How is that going to weave back to what you do? And then this search box was our primary KPI, right? We couldn't actually, we were in a weird situation where we couldn't actually impact the main Alibaba.com website because it was designed in, and run in China. So our primary KPI, the farthest we could get down the funnel to, to optimize to, was, uh, was a search. And this is kind of what it looked like when it all came together. Have a seat, buddy. We're starting. Come on. Oh, wait. That's there we go. We're good. We're good. We're good. Marker. And since this is about user experience and not advertising, I'm not going to show the whole video. But, um, you know, 60, I think it was 30% uh, of people who visited this site uh, wound up conducting a search. Right? So, I'm going to keep it nice and short and sweet. But, um, you know, user experience and storytelling, they're living happily ever after. So I'll take any questions, if anyone has any, and uh, please go to the mic so they can record it. Uh, you, when you were talking about driving emotion and storytelling, how do you bring that kind of thing into business products or uh, specifically things like QuickBooks and accounting and FreshBooks, things like that? Well, I, th I think those are always challenges. You know, there's, you know what Intuit has kind of done, you know, they're doing a lot of innovation in, in terms of how they're approaching things like snap tax, right? To really start with an emotion, right? And think about like, how are we gonna change the, 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 the tax, you know, doing, doing my, my tax return experience based on a consumer insight and do it really fast, right? And they're kind of restructuring their business. I think even in something that's kind of more functional, like, uh, like a, like a, um, like a quicken, even something like contextual help, right, can help guide through the story, right, and, and help people kind of get acclimated qu quicker, right? It's more like, I, it's almost, you know, it's interesting, when I started this, this, um, this presentation, I'd been asked to speak about user experience, and I was thinking about what should I write about, what should I talk about? And we were working with a big solar company. We were working on their website and doing the architecture strategy. And we were talking about kind of this notion of storytelling and user experience and how these long parallax type pages are, are, um, are, are new canvas, right? And we talked about like when we very first started, we did a lot of like CD-ROMs and flash demos, right, for companies because in 2003, that's what people did. Right? But we used to storyboard those, right? It wasn't just, 
you know, we would think through the architecture and then there were storyboards. That kind of, and I think that same kind of notion of like, how can you figure out what, are the, what is the objective that you're trying to accomplish, right? If you're gonna say, I wanna put storytelling in QuickBooks, right? Why, right? What are you trying to accomplish? And then you can extrapolate from there, well, how can I align my, my goal with this human behavior to, to come up with a, a, a way to do that? Yes. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, transmedia? What are you doing to champion that in? And uh, are you looking to grow or collaborate with that? Um, well, I think, you know, when we say everything is interactive, um, that's specifically because we believe in transmedia and, you know, traditionally integrated, um, you know, work, integrated marketing has, has been, you know, here, take this same photo and use it <laughs> in a print ad and on my website, right? So I think, you know, fr from w the way that I think about it, um, you know, we're, we've got mobile devices, we've got uh, different ways we're consuming information, different ways that we create experience. I think that every effort should have a value-oriented component, like how, and, and that value can be delivered in different ways. It can be entertainment, it can be, uh, you know, the ability to be recognized, whatever that is, uh, it, can be, it can be in utility, but that value needs to be thought of holistically, and I, I really think the, the, dif the difference in how do you approach transmedia is to, you know, think about how, does, how do these things tie together? Um, so when you were talking about tone, you used for the dramatic side the ASPCA and uh, working at an animal shelter, I'm really familiar with those uh, Sarah McLaughlin ads. <laughs> but um, when you have conflicting personas that you need to um, address your story to, like we have donors and then we have people coming to adopt animals, what do you, what, what do you suggest for like a home page? to handle like not ending up in the middle, like that boring zone, to handle both ends of the spectrum? Yeah. Well, A, you're a hero. So, you know, my, my wife also works in a shelter. Um, I have yeah. five cats and two pit bulls, so. <laughs> um, um, and, you know, we actually did an exercise for a group called Cat Town um, that was really, similar in terms of thinking about like what is that core message and, and what is that one thing and we did a workshop with them where we helped them kind of say okay what are the unique attributes of their organization they take animals out of the shelter you know and but they also have shelters that so they want to like put down shelters right and uh, you know so it was, it was a complex thing I, I think you know, really, if you, if you look at that triangulation mm -hmm. model, right, of like the consumer, in, the customer insight, like, is there something about your customers that are unique? Mm -hmm. You know, and if you have multiple constituencies, what's the common thread? Mm -hmm. You know, are there common threads, right? Like, what's unique about the product and kind of where do you fit in the landscape and kind of tie that in as your core message? I think, you know, we talk about one thing, um, but, that doesn't mean you can only say one thing, you know, think of that as a prism, you know, and have you, you want all your messages to kind of tie back to that ultimately. Anyone else? Well, let's, oh, one more, Sorry. okay. Uh, one more question. Do you find when you do the storytelling that you have a different strategy between like, consumer, like consumers and business users? Um, Actually, no. I think the, the, the technique is really similar. I, I think um, that uh, we've done a lot of B2B work. You know, being in San Francisco, we're very close to the Valley and all those tech companies. And, um, you know, I think what B2B marketers have a tendency to do is think in terms of product-oriented messages. And, you know, they take the term B2B too seriously. Right? They think of like their customers as bees waiting for their salient points to align with their bees so that they can make a connection, you know? And it's, it, you know, I think what they forget often is that it's about P2P, it's about people, 
right? So having that, those connections. And again, there, there may be, you know, typically in a B2B sale, the difference between that and a consumer sale is that there's more constituents with more, um, more parts of, of the equation. Um, but I think it's really thinking about how do you structure that story and think about uh, in, a, in a linear, how do, you, how do you look at the sea level how do you look at kind of the, the business owner and how do you look at like the hands-on implementer, or, you know, or whatever it may be, those different, and kind of tell a story that's seamless throughout. Um, that's been effective for us. Yes. I have a question. Um, great presentation. Why do you think that more companies don't use storytelling as a vehicle to connect with their clients? Um, because it seems so obvious well you know when I, I looked at those examples and kind of the, the 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 why right I think what's happening right now is a shift right like you know another one of those truisms right that user experience designers is, or information architects have ha always had is like how many people have designed a site whereas like uh, products services solutions about us contact yeah. right and like um, it was kind of seen as more of a framework. But I think right now we've kind of hit this perfect storm of factors from, you know, changing expectations of mobile, changing capabilities for delivery, and uh, this kind of need for brands to engage and, and mm -hmm. think about that. I mean, you think about what Apple's doing in that website, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. not everyone who, who comes to your website is ready to step into your funnel. Right? People still need to be engaged, right? And I think, and, and people need to be persuaded and, and you know, provoked. And, and th that, that's really important because you want people to come back and you want to be able to pull them in later on. So I think right now, um, you know, based on the RFPs I'm getting, brands are starting to think differently, hmm. you know? So I'm optimistic. I mean, honestly, I think the entire internet needs to be rethought. Right? Like every company's website uh, really needs to think differently about how they can connect with people. Hmm. Thank you. All right, I need a drink. No more questions.